Tamahi Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Um, it's nice to have all of you with us. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to be here with you to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Osama Gosby, who is a clinical associate professor at the University of British Columbia, the cardiologist at Absford uh, Regional Hospital, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, Dr. Gusby will speak to us today about diagnostic approach to patients with palpitations. Before that, I would like to introduce the expert panel, faculty, uh, Dr. Fatfi Idris, uh, cardiologist from the USA, Dr. Khaled Al-Wulaid, cardiologist from uh, Libya, and uh, Dr. Isam Baryoun from uh, America, is cardiologist. Um, after we finish the uh, lecture, inshallah, we'll give a chance to the expert panel to say a couple of expert words. Then, inshallah, we'll open it for uh, discussion and to answer questions. Uh, please try to write your questions on the uh, chat box. And also, you can, uh, you can also ask your questions in person by the end of the uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Gusby, uh, I would like to thank you so much for uh, having the time and effort to prepare this presentation to us today. And uh, it's the, the floor is yours now, uh, and you can uh, start your presentation. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على شرف المرسلين بارك الله فيك دكتور عبد الغني بارك الله في الـ expert panel تسمع فيها كويس يا عبد الغني واضح صوت شكرا المدة اللي فاتت كلمني من اللي كلمني على الـ على الـ presentation قال لي نبوك دير presentation على الـ palpitations طبعا الـ palpitations هي هذه ركيكة شوية لكن ما قدرتش نقول لا فتوكلت على الله وحاولت نحاول ندير برزنتيشن فقعدت نسل في روحي what am I going to teach the smartest physicians on the planet that they don't already know فvery quickly I realized that I'm not going to be able to teach them anything so I decided to give a little brief talk about palpitations in general and then talk about two new modalities that patients use to monitor their heart and something that causes or may not cause arrhythmias and something that may or might not be able to treat arrhythmias. And then I'd like to talk about two other controversial uh, topics just to initiate discussion. So there's really not much learning here, but I'm hoping that at the end of the talk, there will be a discussion about the things that we uh, presented today. So palpitations. It is one of the most common symptoms that you're going to face as a physician, especially as a cardiologist. Now, most of these, pal these uh, palpitations are gonna be benign. So luckily we're off the hook. However, it's those small group of people that have dangerous arrhythmias that present as palpitations. And if they're not taken seriously, then these might be missed and we get into trouble. Um, so in order not to miss any dangerous arrhythmias that cause palpitations, you have to have a thorough approach. So what does the patient mean when they say I have palpitations? So we have to define what palpitations is. It's a very subjective symptom. And when you start talking about something that's subjective, it's difficult to define. But in general, it's an unpleasant awareness of the heart, whether it's a forceful beat, whether it's rapid, whether it's regular or irregular. Some people will describe it as a fluttering sensation or a flip-flop sensation or a pounding sensation. They can feel it in their chest or even their neck. Now we'll probably have to talk about the terms that are used back home in Libya. Obviously they're gonna be different. So what does the patient want to know when they come to see you for palpitations? Very simple. What is this doctor? What is causing these palpitations that I have? Is it serious? Is it going to kill me? And what can you do about it? <clears throat> what does the doctor want to know? The doctor wants to know that he's not gonna be sued. And if anything happens, to him or any bad outcome happens to the patient, that the family is not going to come after him. So there are different ways of classifying 
palpitations and how to approach them. This is one way. You divide it into having a normal rate and a normal rhythm. And then we'll go into the differential of each one. Normal rate, irregular rhythm. Fast rate, normal rhythm. And fast rate, irregular rhythm. If you can just start off with this in terms of differential diagnosis in your head, when you start asking the patient questions, hopefully you won't miss many arrhythmias um, when you use this approach. Now, this is not the only approach. Maybe during the discussion, other people might have different way of uh, starting off, but this I found this very simple and easy to remember. And it helps me remember the differential diagnosis under each one. So for example, uh, normal rate, normal rhythm is gonna be a normal sinus rhythm. Um, normal rate, irregular rhythm, and you can see the differentials there, atrial flutter, PACs, PVCs, etc. Fast rate, regular rhythm, either sinus tachycardia or atrial tachycardia or SVT, most commonly atrial flutter can also be regular with two to one conduction. Pacemaker mediated tachycardia can be regular. Accelerated junctional rhythm can be regular. And obviously VT can also be regular. Fast and irregular, the classic is atrial fibrillation, but you can also get atrial flutter with variable conduction or variable block, as well as um, uh, six sinus syndrome and multifocal atrial tachycardia. So cardiac etiologies um, is the main one that uh, we're usually uh, faced with. However, there are different etiologies of palpitations, a lot of etiologies. And it's better to classify them into systems so that you don't forget them. Because if you just have a big laundry list under everything, then you might not uh, remember everything. So if you divide it into categories, then it's easier to remember the conditions under each category. So cardiac causes, we know arrhythmias are going to cause palpitations, but other conditions like valvular heart disease and intracardiac shunts and myxomas can cause palpitations as well. High output states. Um, let's not forget pregnancy is a high output state, and there are a lot of patients who present uh, with palpitations during pregnancy. In fact, a lot of uh, the arrhythmias that may happen before pregnancy are made worse during pregnancy. Anemia is a cause and uh, fever. Metabolic causes like hyperthyroidism is a classic one. Catecholamine in excess, whether it's due to exercise or stress. Substance abuse, very important. Uh, cocaine, alcohol, nicotine, caffeine, which we will discuss later on, might not really be a cause. Medications, um, beta blockers, uh, beta blocker withdrawal is a very classic one. We do sometimes tend to forget about this one since we sometimes ask for medication and the patient doesn't say they have beta blockers on board. And so we don't uh, remember this all the time. So just keep this in mind. Psychiatric disorders, very important uh, because it can be very frustrating when you've done all the workup, very expensive workup, and you end up finding nothing and it ends up being just a panic disorder. You could have saved uh, the healthcare system a lot of money just by uh, diagnosing that the patient had anxiety or a panic attack. So evaluation of palpitations. Palpitations in general have not been studied in very big studies. So all these studies that I'm going to quote you are very small studies that can be torn apart, really. But uh, nonetheless, they give us an insight or ideas of what we may use uh, to help manage or approach these patients. So in one study, they looked at 190 consecutive patients who presented with a chief complaint of palpitations. They found that 84% had a known etiology. So they, they diagnosed the cause. 16%, they were not able to diagnose the cause. And out of the 84% known causes, 43% were cardiac. But look how many psychiatric uh, causes were 31%, so almost a third of all causes of palpitations in this study, of course, even though it's a small one, were due to psychiatric issues, not necessarily something that we would, would say medical that you can uh, treat the classic way we treat our cardiac conditions. And about 10% had other causes. So what are the predictors of a cardiac cause of palpitations or arrhythmias? 
Number one is being a male. Number two, if the rhythm is irregular, then it's likely to be cardiac. If the patient has a history of heart disease, it's likely to be cardiac. And if the duration is greater than five minutes. So how do we approach palpitations? I cannot emphasize this enough. History, history, history. A very important and thorough history will help you save time and money and hassle for the patient. After taking the history, you will go on to physical exam and then maybe an ECG and some limited labs. However, if you do suspect that there's a cardiac cause of these palpitations, then other investigations might be needed, but make sure that you don't over-investigate and cost the system a lot of money for no reason. In terms of history taking, there are a number of categories, and it's a very extensive list. And as you can see there, I'm not gonna go mention them all at the moment, but you can see under each category, you have to have a certain uh, number of questions that you're gonna ask to help you sift through the long list of causes of palpitations. So age. Age is, an, is not an independent predictor of the presence of cardiac cause. So just because a patient is old does not mean that they're gonna have a cardiac cause, or if the patient is uh, young, doesn't mean that they're gonna have, not gonna have a cardiac cause. In fact, uh, if uh, patients who uh, have AV and RT and AVRT usually present during childhood, whereas other uh, arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation or tachycard atrial tachycardia or flutter uh, will present in older patients. Having said that, older age is a risk factor for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias, but not exclusively, because we know that adolescents can have life-threatening arrhythmias as well, such as ARVC or idiopathic VT or um, uh, outflow, fl outflow tract uh, VT or congenital long QT syndromes that can cause arrhythmias, which are usually life-threatening. The duration. If they say doctor it only lasts for an instant, then it's likely PACs or PVCs. If it's sustained, then you have to look for longer arrhythmias such as SVT or VT and the differentials under that. <clears throat> Rate and rhythm. Um, this is something that you have to discuss with the patient. And some, something that we all need to learn how to do is to tap on our desk the rhythm of the, to the patient, or ask the patient themselves to tap on the desk on your, in your office of what they feel. And very commonly, you can easily differentiate a regular rhythm from an irregular rhythm just by doing that, which will help you right away in your differential. Remember that presyncope or syncope, syncope is rare in palpitations, but if it does happen, then you need to be very careful not to miss anything that's hemodynamically significant and might cause uh, very uh, bad outcomes for the patient. Abruptness of onset. So it's important to ask the patient whether the, uh, the onset is random or episodic, which would suggest PACs or PVCs. If it's a gradual onset and a gradual resolution, or I ask them, kind of a, 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 a slow warm, uh, warm down, um, then it's sinus tachycardia. If it's abrupt onset or abrupt resolution or both, then you need to think about SVTs like AVNRT or, A, or, or AVRT, et cetera. However, abrupt onset is not always very helpful because they can say it was abrupt or it wasn't abrupt and sometimes the patient doesn't always feel or remember the abruptness um, of the uh, onset. However, once they do get the arrhythmia, eventually when they recognize it, they will recognize the offset, which was more helpful. You can ask them whether the patient, whether they're able to terminate their arrhythmia. So whether they can do the carotid sinus massage or vagal maneuvers. And if they do, that would usually suggest that it is an SVT. Postural changes. So we will discuss this a little bit later as well, but certain positions may precipitate certain arrhythmias. 
and certain positions may make certain palpitations or arrhythmias more noticeable. So for example, if patient is bending down and they sit upright and all of a sudden get palpitations, this may indicate onset of an AVNRT. Whereas if the patient says, doctor, at night when I lay on my side, I feel my uh, palpitations, then those could be just a PAC or a PVC, especially when the apex of the heart is more closer to the chest wall when you're laying on your left side and the patient is more aware of them. Exercise is important. So if people, if patients <clears throat> have arrhythmias during exercise, this is something for concern, especially in young athletes. And in these patients, um, they can get an SVT or the atrial fibrillation uh, is brought on by exercise. Usually at the end of exercise, since there's a little bit of an increased vagal tone, which can trigger atrial fibrillation. Like I said, it's usually seen in uh, athletic men that are young. I'm glad they mentioned that 50 is still young, so that's a good thing. Um, other arrhythmias during exercise can be found in people who have structural heart disease or ischemia, and those are usually either ventricular tachycardia. Um, usually, a, an, an arrhythmia that occurs during exercise that's not sustained is generally benign. Emotional distress. Um, we all know this classically from our medical school years that certain long QT syndrome types will develop polymorphic VT or VT if somebody startles them or yells them or anything that might uh, make them get shocked um, can precipitate the arrhythmias and the palpitations. A focused physical exam. So this is just the laundry list of what some physical exam findings that you need to look for and what they may suggest, starting with the patient's temperature. Now, obviously we don't measure this much in the office, but if you can, that's good, but you can also ask the patient. Um, so if they do have um, a high temperature or fever, you might need to think about inflammation and malignancy or myxomas causing the tachycardia and the palpitations. Check their blood pressure. Um, if it's high, then you think about femochromocytomas or drug abuse, or again, beta blocker withdrawal. Uh, auscultation, if they have a mi uh, mitral valve prolapse, can present uh, with mitral valve, mitral valve prolapse syndrome and PVCs and palpitations. If there is a harsh murmur suggestive of LVOT obstruction, then you should think about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy um, and so on. If the JVP is elevated and you hear an S3 cardiomyopathy, which can be associated with arrhythmias and palpitations, um, expiratory wheezes, COPD, which uh, is a common cause of palpitations and arrhythmias, including MAT and atrial tachycardia, et cetera, and looking for signs of hyper hyperthyroidism. This is an article that looked at evidence-based approach to palpitations. However, there's really no good evidence. Uh, and even in their article, if you look at this list that I've put on the left, uh, the right-hand side, at the bottom there, they say this information, the information in this table is based on clinical experience and not data from clinical trials. So these are just some key findings that you can uh, look for or ask the patient that will help you uh, figure out what the cause of the palpitations is. And I'll let you read this at your leisure. Uh, I'll, I'll be providing the presentation, of course, at the end. So how do we risk stratify patients who have palpitations? Uh, you can risk stratify them into low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. Low risk really shouldn't even be, make it to the cardiologist's office, but sometimes patients uh, insist and pressure their primary care physician to refer, but generally if it's just a skip beat or a thumping beat, and they have no family history of heart disease and no structural heart disease with a normal ECG, these are usually low risk and we don't have to worry about them too much. Intermediate risk uh, could be followed up by a specialist, but not necessarily. Usually they're recurrent tachyarrhythmias and uh, palpitations that are associated with symptoms, as well as an abnormal ECG or a possible uh, structural heart uh, disease. Now, high risk, um, certain, certain palpitations that occur during exercise, 
certain palpitations prior to syncope, um, high-risk structural heart disease, family history of sudden cardiac death, and obviously heart block if it develops. So what are the investigations that we do in patients with, uh, who are referred to us by, for palpitations? As you can see, I've just listed here what these potential investigations are. So from the left here, we can see the Apple Watch, which we will discuss, or the, not just Apple Watch, but um, watches that help patients monitor their heart rate. And now they're going into monitoring heart rhythm as well. Um, certain devices that uh, connect to your phone via Bluetooth and help you produce a one lead or even six lead ECG. Uh, Holter monitors, obviously the basic ECG, an echocardiogram, a tilt table test, and some laboratory investigations. So let's just start going through them. So assessing patients with palpitations doesn't always need to include an extensive panel of labs. So just checking the hemoglobin, make sure that they're anemic and their uh, thyroid function tests, as well as some electrolytes and a tox screen is more than enough initially. Um, now, even despite mentioning these uh, potentially four different categories, there's really no evidence-based guidelines to tell us what to do. It's gonna have to be tailored towards the patient and the findings you find from your history and your physical exam. These two fine gentlemen are the ones who invented the ECG. The gentleman on the right, Dr. Waller, is the one who started off um, and, and um, kind of discovered the ECG machine. But then uh, Dr. Eindhoven is the one, I believe, who kind of named the QRS, the, sorry, the ECG uh, waves as P, Q, R, S, T, and so on, and made this ECG machine. So this is the first ECG machine. Uh, as you can see, he has his hand and foot in a saline solution, I believe, to try and conduct electricity through that uh, scary machine. Anyway, we've progressed quite a lot. So what to look for? I'm not gonna tell um, cardiologists what to look for on ECG, but uh, obviously just reading the ECG thoroughly and making sure that when you're reading it, you have the differential in your mind uh, of what the patient has presented with. So the patient presented with palpitations, you need to comb through the ECG to look for causes of palpitations. Similarly, the patient presents with chest pain, you need to comb through the ECG looking for potential causes of chest pain. This gentleman here is Dr. Holter, who invented the Holter monitor. So you can see on the left here, this is the first Holter monitor and what it looked like. And I can't remember how much it weighed, but it was very heavy. And you can see that this gentleman on the right here who was wearing the Holter monitor uh, on his back so that he can uh, record the ECG tracings. So what are the indications for a Holter monitor? Now, I say here low risk, not indicated, but in reality, it is very difficult to say no to a patient who comes and says, you know, doctor, can I get a Holter monitor just to make sure it's fine, even though they have a low risk of having a serious cause of their palpitations. For example, it's unsustained, they're not really that symptomatic from it, and there's no evidence of heart disease. However, if there's high risk features, then it's a non-brainer, you will need to do a Holter monitor, and there are different types of Holter monitors. Again, I put on the bottom there that the patient may ask for it, and we can do it just for the patient's reassurance if you notice that the patient's a little bit anxious uh, about their palpitations. These are different types of Holter monitors or monitoring systems. So let's start off with the bottom right here, the classic um, Holter monitor. There are some three, lead, three wires or five wires, depending on how many channels uh, you would like. Now these Holter monitors can be uh, worn for 24 hours, for 48 hours, or for two weeks, or for even four weeks. Now these can be either uh, event monitors, whereby the patient um, wears them and it records when there's an event only. And usually that event monitor is programmed to record two minutes prior to an event and two minutes after the event. But other than that, it's not always recording. 
whereas the um, the two week or the month one month halter monitor will record everything for the whole duration. And you can see there are new new kind of sophisticated, easier to put on patches that will give very good tracings. Then there are the implantable loop recorders. So these are the, are the top left. You can see here that there are three types with different companies. The smallest one here is called the Reveal uh, device. And it's, we call it implantable loop recorder. You have to have a very good reason to implant this device because it's not without its complications. It is very too easy to insert, but it costs about, at least here in Canada, about uh, $3,500 for the device, not including the hospital fees and the physician fees. So what about Holter monitors? So the 24 hour Holter monitors are usually limited because of the limited duration of time. However, um, when you do the Holter monitor, you might pick up arrhythmias without the patient even noticing them. So they just go over, I wanna go over two small trials. And again, these are not big trials and not you know, superbly um, uh, conducted trials, but one trial that looked at 1,400 patients with palpitations, and they were aged 60 to 94. About 8.3% of these people complained of palpitations, but 12.6% had arrhythmias. So more had, so there were about almost 4% of people had arrhythmias that they didn't really know about. And the prevalence of palpitation was similar in patients with and without the documented arrhythmias. So some, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for when you, get, you know, put a patient, when you put a halter on a patient. In another trial about for, a, uh, looked at 518 patients who underwent a 24 hour halter monitor, 34% experienced typical palpitations. So they say, doctor, I had palpitations. And then when you look at the uh, monitor, the halter monitor, the rhythm was normal. There was nothing. In a way, this is not a bad thing because it reassures the patient and reassures you that their symptoms are not that serious. And when they do complain of this, these symptoms, <clears throat> the uh, rhythm is normal. So what about continuous loop devices? These are the <clears throat> usually two week monitors compared to the 24 hour Holter monitor. Um, when they looked at five patients retrospectively who had a continuous loop monitor um, and uh, Holter monitors, they looked at the diagnostic yield. So 83% had a diagnosis uh, from a loop recorder. Only 35% had a diagnosis with a Holter monitor, the 24-hour Holter monitor. When they looked into the um, loop recorders, or event monitors, these are not the implanted ones. They found out that they were able to find the cause and make a diagnosis in the first two weeks. So 87% in the first two weeks, you had the diagnosis. In about 9%, it took about four weeks to get the diagnosis. But the yield is much better with um, event monitors and it's more cost-effective. <clears throat> so let's talk about the Apple Watch or the Fitbit or the Garmin. Um, I've had a lot of patients, and I'm sure you, you know, all of our colleagues have had patients come with Apple Watches telling them, doctor, my Apple Watch said that my heart is either irregular or fast, um, and I don't feel well. Is it true or not? So there was a large scale study, but it was sponsored by Apple, and I'm a very anti-Apple person. I'm a very pro-Android person. But nonetheless, I have to admit, uh, Apple does have a good product. Um, and they looked at whether the uh, Apple Watch was able to um, detect atrial fibrillation. So there were about over 400,000 participants. And again, this was a very poorly uh, designed uh, study, but because of its novelty and they call it a pragmatic study, it was actually published in the New England Journal. So out of these four, over 400,000 participants, 2,000 and uh, just over 2,000 patients had a notification of an irregular pulse from their watch. Once they received the regular uh, notification, 
they were sent ECG patches to form a whole to uh, get a Holter monitor. Out of those 2,000 patients, only 450 people participated and sent a very good quality ECG patch data that can actually be interpreted. Out of these 450 patients, 34% had atrial fibrillation. Out of these 34%, 35% were patients that were 65 years old, 65 years and older. And what they said was that 84% of notifications were concordant with atrial fibrillation. Now, this talk is not about atrial fibrillation, but it does help to know that if a patient complains to you about palpitations and they say, doctor, my Apple Watch is telling me that I have an abnormal uh, rhythm to look into it because it might be uh, real. So let me just go back. With regards to the uh, watches or the Apple Watch, um, I had a patient a few months ago who came and told me that my watch is telling me that his heart rate is about 200. Uh, sorry, he was actually referred to me by the GP because he told his uh, family doctor that. And so when he came and taking the history and I asked him whether he felt anything while his heart rate was, well, his watch was telling him it was 200. And he says, well, you know, sometimes I feel it, sometimes I don't. It usually happens when I exert myself. So how am I going to figure out whether this is real or not? And he showed me the watch, but his watch did not uh, record an ECG, just a heart rate. So I told him, let's do this experiment. I gave him a 14-day Holter monitor. I told him to do all the things that he does that trigger the fast heart rate recording on the Apple Watch and document the time and date, and we'll see whether it correlates with anything on the Holter monitor. And lo and behold, um, before I told him the uh, result, I asked him, did you have any palpitations at that time? And he says, yes, I felt palpitations. I felt lightheaded. And when I looked at the Holter monitor, it was completely normal. So sometimes the you know technology is good, but it does have its limitations. And um, don't always believe everything that you see. What about a device called a live core or cardia mobile? I have to admit, I use this quite often because it has helped me and the, or helped the patients, most of all, and helped me um, decipher what the patient's actually feeling. And in good hands, uh, especially you know, young people, although some older people are very you know, tech savvy and are able to do this easily, you can get some very good tracings. And those are just examples of tracings um, of a Cardia mobile device. And you can see, you know, you're gonna have some good tracings and some bad tracings, um, but nonetheless, I find it helpful. So this has been studied again in atrial fibrillation. This seems to be the main kind of reason why people look into this, but we can use it in assessing patients with palpitations as well, because if they have palpitations and you want to look for the reason and you catch a fib, uh, that's fine. So it's called the peak AF trial. Now, what they did in this trial is they looked at 75 patients who were coming in for an SVT ablation. So they've documented SVT, they know they have it, and they're going to get treated for it with ablation. But what they did was they took four ECGs, two ECGs from the Cardia Mobile and two 12 lead ECGs. Each one, each one of them, one had an ECG of sinus tachycardia and one had an ECG of SVT. Um, and so a total of four ECGs. Then they randomized these, uh, they anonymized these ECGs and gave them to two blinded electrophysiologists. And the control here was the actual intracardiac EC, procedural ECG um, so that they know what the diagnosis was, and then they can discuss it uh, with the two cardiologists who read the uh, ECGs. So the question was, is it an SVT or a sinus tachycardia? And what the quality of the ECGs were from the SMART, the SECG, they call it, or the SMART ECG. The uh, patient population was 63% females. The age was about 50 plus or minus 18. The mean BMI was 26 plus or minus five uh, kilograms per meter squared. And each cardiologist or electrophysiologist read about 150 ECGs. And the results were as follows. 
So on the left-hand side here are the smart or the uh, cardiomobile ECGs. The blue is SVT, the orange is uh, sinus tachycardia. So for the SVT, the cardiologists were correct in 133 over 150 ECGs. The cardiologists were correct in diagnosing 137 sinus tachycardias. Now, this is all the tracings, but when they looked at the high quality tracings only, the sensitivity was about 95% and the specificity was 92%. Before uh, looking at the high quality ECGs only, the specificity was a little bit less and the sensitivity was a little bit less. Now with the 12 lead ECGs, obviously, you know, they got 100% right for SVT and almost 100% right for uh, sinus tachycardia. These are very good results. They had another study that looked at uh, cardiomobile and um, atrial fibrillation called the REHEARSE AFib uh, trial. And what they did is they randomized, uh, well, it's a randomized controlled trial for screening for atrial fibrillation. I believe this was done in the UK. Let me just make sure, I think it was done in the UK. Yes, it was. And what they did was they looked at um, patients who were greater, six, greater than uh, or equal to 60, 65 years old, had a CHAD score, CHAD's VASC score of greater than or equal to two, and no history of prior atrial fibrillation. And they monitored them for uh, 12 months. Compared to patients who are just left for routine care, so they just followed them, but did not tell them to come in for anything, just left them uh, on their own, but monitored their health overall. There were about 1,000 patients, 500 in the um, alive core ECGs and about 500 in the routine care. With the 500 uh, cardiomobile ECGs, they asked them to do twice a week ECGs and send it to the uh, center, which is a lot, twice a week for 12 months. Um, and they asked them to take extra ECGs if they had any uh, symptoms uh, develop. The primary outcome was time to diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. The other outcomes were cost per atrial fibrillation diagnosis in the cardiomobile uh, patients. The results. So 19 patients from the cardiomobile group were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation in one year. Five patients were diagnosed in the routine care group. When they looked at the cost, in, a, in order to diagnose an atrial fibrillation patient using the cardiomobile doing ECGs twice a week for 12 months, it will cost about $10,000, just over $10,000. Interestingly, six patients in the cardiomobile group had strokes, ischemic strokes, whereas 10 patients in the routine care had uh, strokes. Now, this is not statistically significant, but numerically significant. So if you, you may have prevented four strokes. And if you ask a patient, is a stroke or not getting a stroke worth $10,000 for you? I think we know what the answer is. So they concluded that screening with the cardiomobile ECG is just under four times more likely to identify atrial fibrillation than routine care in the community. Question, what is the most widely used pharmacologically active substance in the world? And if you say coffee then or caffeine, then you are correct. So caffeine, unfortunately, has been beaten up all over the place and gotten a very bad press. And depending on you know, the season, sometimes we say coffee is good, sometimes we say coffee is bad. So let's try and uh, go into this, and I'm hoping this will create a discussion afterwards. So first of all, what are the pharmacokinetics of caffeine? Caffeine is very well absorbed, about 100% actually, and quickly absorbed. So within one hour of having your espresso shot, um, all that caffeine is going to be in your system. And whether it's an empty stomach or not, you'll still absorb all of it, but the rate of absorption will go down with 
uh, food. The effect of caffeine in your body will usually disappear within 10 to 60 hours. Interestingly, caffeine does cross the placenta and breast milk. And I wonder if any study has been done to see whether the kids or the children of women who drink a lot of coffee during pregnancy and during breast uh, feeding uh, end up being uh, caffeine junkies or not, but I don't think that study has been done yet. So overall, let me just start off by saying that despite all the theoretical relationships of caffeine with arrhythmias, it does not provoke arrhythmias in the usual dose or consumed amount that we drink, up to five cups or even more than five cups, as we will see in a study. However, if a patient comes and tells you, doctor, when I drink coffee, I get palpitations, you know, we're not going to argue with that patient. I mean, you are sensitive to caffeine. And just to note that in, there's more in coffee than just caffeine. In fact, there was somewhere I read that it's all, almost like 150 different things that are in coffee, and caffeine is just one of them. So caffeine and cardiac ectopy. So this was a... Uh, study that looked into the cardiovascular health study, which is a big study that um, looked at patients and information they kept about themselves and diaries and so on. But just to focus on um, the caffeine and ectopy or palpitations, they looked at just over 1400 patients that were greater than 65 years old who completed a diary um, about their symptoms they had a 24 hour Holter monitor. And what they found that people who were drinking coffee, in people who were drinking coffee, there were no differences in the number of PACs or PVCs across different levels of coffee intake. This was the recent study that was published about coffee. And I'm hoping that this might put things to rest, but again, unfortunately the source of this data um, might not always be that robust, but nonetheless, um, I'm hoping that uh, we don't have to look at this uh, anymore. But we'll see what happens in the discussion. Maybe people have other opinions and other resources and studies that they've seen. So this study looked at the UK Biobank, which is a bank of information about 500,000 people uh, in the UK and stores their genetic information and their health information and behavioral information. And this is what this study looked at. So they looked at this under just under 500,000 participants between January 2006 and December 2020. And the follow-up was up until August of 2021. I think the median uh, follow-up was about 12 years, if I'm not mistaken. They excluded people who withdrew their information from the bank, bank, obviously, or those who did not provide all the information, such as how much they smoke, how much they drink, or, and so on. Um, if patients reported atrial fibrillation, they were excluded. If patients had cardiovascular disease, they were excluded. And the coffee consumption was split into six groups, either no coffee, less than one cup, one cup, two to three cups, four to five cups, and greater than five cups. They looked at three types of coffee. One was decaffeinated coffee because of this uh, question of maybe it's not the caffeine that causes the palpitations and the cardiovascular events uh, effects. They looked at instant coffee, which is a lot of what the British people usually drink, and grand coffee, which is more common in North America and uh, some European countries. So the impact uh, of coffee was looked at uh, through the, its effect uh, on cardiovascular disease, which was uh, described as coronary artery disease, heart failure, ischemic stroke, arrhythmias, which is our uh, concern here today, ectopy, AFib, flutter, SVT, and VT or VFib, mortality, with an, uh, looking at the all-cause mortality or cardiovascular mortality plus sudden cardiac death. And the primary outcome was relationship of coffee subtypes and the incidence of arrhythmias, uh, as well as cardiovascular disease and mortality. So what were the results? This is just to show you how many people drank what type of coffee. So 
there were over 100,000 non-coffee drinkers, over 68,000 decaffeinated uh, coffee drinkers, 82,000 ground coffee drinkers, but mostly almost 200,000 instant coffee uh, drinkers. Um, I was going to make my own graphs for the uh, results, but this looked so nice and so colorful that I thought this would look uh, much nicer. So let's look at the effects of caffeine or coffee on arrhythmias. So any arrhythmias, which included all the atrial fibrillation, flutter, SVT, and VTVF, if you look at the first top left box, the, uh, the, the, purple, the dark purple color is the control, the people who do not uh, drink coffee. And then after that, one, uh, no cu uh, one cup and so on. You can see that there was, no, there was no difference, no statistically significant difference if you drank less than one cup, but then the difference starts to occur if you drink one uh, up to five cups, you have a lower risk of developing arrhythmias, all arrhythmias, if you drank coffee. Now, if you, you split it into sub, sub, uh, separate subcategories, atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation, you had a less uh, incidence of atrial fibrillation if you drank two to, two to five cups of coffee. Regarding SVT, there was a less incidence of SVT in people who drank two to five cups of coffee. And in VTVF, there were less events in those who drank two to uh, five cups of coffee. You can see that there's a little bit of a U-curve relationship here. Um, but the uh, looking at the different types of arrhythmias and um, which ones were the most, about 15, so there are about 30,000 arrhythmias. Um, about 15,000 were atrial fibrillation and flutter, about 3,000 were SVT, and about 208 were VT and VFib. So again, um, we're assuming that these arrhythmias are going to cause some palpitations. Not all of them, of course, as we know, but at least uh, we know that caffeine is not going to be a major cause. And in fact, it's actually possibly protective. So what are the key points of this study? So overall, the lowest risk of any arrhythmia was seen with two to three cups of coffee a day. There was a significant reduction in atrial fibrillation or flutter, as well as SVT in those consuming one to five cups per day, with a peak reduction in four to five cups a day. For VT or VFib, the lowest was about four to five cups a day, and decaffeinated coffee was associated with a neutral effect on arrhythmias. Magnesium. Is there any role for magnesium? There's really no randomized trials looking into magnesium. However, I do have to confess, and I'll see what uh, the discussion leads to. I do sometimes use magnesium for PVCs, and I'll, uh, we'll talk about it after the talk. Uh, however, in heart failure patients, this may be different. So those who attended the talk uh, by uh, uh, Mahmoud last week in heart failure, we tried to keep the magnesium levels greater than two. Again, there are no major trials looking at this. This is an old trial that I found in patients with heart failure. It was done in the 1990s before I was born and it looked at 30 patients who came in with heart failure their ejection fraction was about 23%. They had no history of ventricular arrhythmias. And shocking was they excluded patients who were on beta blockers or antiarrhythmics or calcium channel blockers. And so this was a double-blinded placebo-control crossover design. They looked at the effect of IV magnesium on these patients who came in with heart failure. They gave them a bolus of magnesium and then a 24-hour continuous infusion. And then they switched the patients after a washout period, and they gave them the same thing. What did they find? They found that there was a significant reduction in the total PVCs per hour, in the total couplets per day, and in the total of VT runs per day in patients who came in with symptomatic heart failure. Now, I don't know of any patient who has heart failure today who's not on 
beta blockers unless they are extremely bradycardic and have significant side effects and so on. But whether this study is only going to be for people who are not on beta blockers or whether we can extrapolate it to patients who are on beta blockers, we'll see what the panel says and what the discussion comes up with. Okay, fairly quickly, I want to talk about two uh, syndromes um, fairly quickly that are very difficult. You will see them. Uh, they're very frustrating to manage. They're very stressful for the patients and need a lot of patience from the physician to try and almost literally hold the patient's hand through these two conditions. So the first one is postural tachycardia syndrome or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, when I was a resident and read about this condition, I always thought that there had to be a drop in blood pressure because we associated the word orthostatic with a drop in blood pressure because orthostatic hypotension. And in fact, orthostatic is just a word meaning upright. So you can have orthostatic hypotension, orthostatic tachycardia, orthostatic anything. It's just a description of a position. So just because it's in a syndrome's name does not mean that the patient has a low blood pressure. So what is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome? It is a vague syndrome. Essentially, people have orthostatic intolerance. When they stand up, they are symptomatic. The mechanism of this, as we will see, is not known. And when you have something that's being described as having multiple um, mechanisms, that means we really don't know the mechanism. And the symptoms may be intermittent, but may be persistent. And you hope that they are intermittent in the patients that you see, because if they're persistent, they're gonna be in your office very often. Um, I like to call this the POTS triad. So you have to have excessive tachycardia, with orthostatic intolerance and no hypotension. So if you have hypo hypotension, it's not POTS. If you have no symptoms when you stand up, it's not POTS. So these three things have to be present at a minimum. So these are the mechanisms. One mechanism is due to small fiber neuropathy or dysautonomia. I don't know, we'll, I guess we'll talk about this in the discussion. Uh, there are dysautonomia or autonomic dysfunction clinics. And some of them now are being run by cardiologists, some of them run by neurologists, but apparently it's an evolving field and uh, different syndromes are being uh, lumped into this uh, category. These, this particular etiology can cause nausea or vomiting, bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, mostly GI symptoms. Another mechanism is hypovolemia and being deconditioned. So these people are usually, uh, they have a decreased intravascular volume. Um, so therefore their um, stroke volume is reduced and also LV mass is reduced. These are similar to patients who have um, been deconditioned and laying uh, flat or uh, not doing anything for two weeks. Um, and the problem with these people, with the hypovolemia or deconditioning is that the patients try to avoid activity when in fact, one of the treatments for it is increasing activity. I think Abdelghani is telling me to hurry up. I'll try and do my best. Um, we can stop if people want to stop, um, but I'll continue until uh, Abdelghani just stops me. Another mechanism is autoimmunity. This is very important because it occurs after post-viral infection, and we'll talk about this as well. It could be also due to neuroendocrine dysfunction, uh, due to a hyperadrenergic state causing these symptoms. The epidemiology is usually white, young females. Um, clinical features, there you can divide them into orthostatic symptoms and non-orthostatic symptoms. Orthostatic symptoms are palpitations, lightheadedness, uh, blurry vision, fogginess, shortness of breath, maybe chest pain, uh, difficulty concentrating. Non-orthostatic symptoms can include fatigue, cold feet, which is very useful. Patients will have almost like mottled feet, um, depression, anxiety. Um, the, I'll leave these for you, the audience, to read uh, at their leisure. What are, so how do we diagnose POTS? Uh, you have to have an increase in heart rate of 30 beats per minute if you are less than 20 years old, or 40 beats per minute, sorry, 
uh, if you are more than 20 years old, or 40 beats per minute, if you are less than 20 years old, above the resting baseline, within 10 minutes of standing, or uh, head up tilt test, without a drop in blood pressure, without a drop in blood pressure. If you have um, postural changes without heart, uh, heart rate change, then it's not uh, POTS. So how do you test this in the office? I did this today actually in my office. Uh, let the patient lay supine for five minutes, then check their baseline and heart rate. Preferably use a pulse oximeter. Don't you rely on the blood pressure machine. Stand them for one minute and monitor and see what the heart rate is. Uh, check their blood pressure again. If it's not diagnostic after one minute, do it again in three, five, and 10 minutes. What are the investigations we do? Very limited. You can check the CBC, TSH, and electrolytes. Um, in terms of ECG, uh, other investigations, you can do an ECG or a tilt table test, maybe an echo in certain individuals. Treatments, there are pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatments. We usually start with non-pharmacologic treatments, which uh, includes uh, fluid, uh, drinking fluid, usually about three to four liters a day. Um, I read somewhere that you should ask them to drink about half a liter at a time when they do, do drink their water. Increase salt, uh, exercise. This is a problem because they say, I don't feel well when they exercise. So you have to tell them to start off with exercises while they're sitting to strengthen their lower extremity muscles so that they can prevent pooling of the uh, uh, blood or volume in their legs when they stand up. Lifestyle management in terms of avoiding uh, stressful situations, anxiety dealing with, uh, dealing with anxiety and so on. And compression garments. So you can use an abdominal compression uh, belt, which is probably more helpful because apparently there's a lot of volume that's in the abdominal uh, vasculature than the lower extremities, or you can use both, but the compression stockings that are up to the waist are sometimes difficult to wear and sometimes difficult to, um, uh, to tolerate. Pharmacological management is not always useful, but beta blockers can be helpful. Um, I tend to gravitate towards evabradine if I'm not successful. For some reason, these patients have low blood pressure to begin with, um, although some of them might have high blood pressure after certain uh, situations. Um, overall, medication is not very helpful. You can see these, the different types of options. Now, what's the talk about anything these days uh, without COVID? So POTS can be caused by COVID or brought on by COVID. We don't know for sure, but as you remember, one of the mechanisms was viral, uh, prior viral infection. And I've already seen this, patients who have had uh, uh, COVID infection. In fact, um, interestingly, an 18-year-old boy today that I saw in the office um, had COVID infection in July and has not been uh, the same since. I just looked at his 14-day Holter monitor and his heart rate goes up into the 170s just by standing up and feels the chest pain, the shortness of breath, and so on. So I suspect that you will see this in patients who have had COVID. Um, it's a matter of how, how uh, when, not if. Um, I was going to talk about inappropriate sinus tachycardia, but Abdelghani, do you think we should stop? Uh, I think we had enough. Uh, it's excellent talk. We'd like to continue until tomorrow, but uh, we may wrap up and uh, we'll have uh, time for the discussion, inshallah. OK. Thank you very much. Abdelhani. Naam. I, I hear you, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're good here. Uh, you can just say for final words, then we'll open for discussion, inshallah. Naam? If you have your conclusion, and then we'll discuss. We'll La khalas, discuss. Uh, conclusion, there was a lot of stuff to conclude, but I can conclude maybe just by saying that palpitations uh, can be easy to treat and can be very difficult to treat. Uh, keep an open mind. Uh, the patient came to you because they have a concern. 
and try to either alleviate that concern or treat that concern. Uh, do not blow off the new devices that are coming up that patients are using, including watches and the uh, cardio mobile, for example. Um, remember that caffeine does not cause atrial fibrillation. Caffeine does not cause uh, palpitations in general. However, if a patient tells you they have it, then they have it. Um, do not forget about POTS. Do not forget about the, the how to diagnose it. Do not forget about COVID and POTS. And that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent talk. Uh, well done, Osama. Really, uh, it's a huge topic. It takes a long time. And uh, actually, you mastered the presentation very well by summarizing what we're looking for. It's actually uh, it's a fantastic talk. Thank you very much for the time and effort. Uh, just I'm going to say a couple of words, then I'll open uh, the uh, uh, the floor to my other colleagues from the expert panel to say a couple of uh, expert words about the presentation, and then we'll open for our discussion, inshallah, quickly. Uh, for me, it's, it's excellent presentation again, and uh, for for us, we have to remember to go systematic, as you Sam mentioned, about taking history and physical examination and then necessary investigations as by taking good history and physical exam, you may rule out most of the high-risk patients, but remember always to ask about the high-risk features. If you want to miss things, don't miss the high-risk features. Very important, like age, patients with heart, uh, with heart disease, especially ischemic heart disease, old MI, and uh, patients who come with syncope, uh, palpitations after exercise. Uh, family history, very important, sudden, family history of sudden death or family history of other rhythmia. The patient might tell you, yeah, just yesterday, I had a patient who had WW, she came to me, she said, my sister had WW, bang, you have a diagnosis. So just uh, by uh, taking some history, you may be able to sort out most of the diagnosis. Then if it's difficult, you have to investigate to out underlying pathologists. Uh, ECG, always do an ECG in the office if you have capability. It's very, very, very important to help you to diagnose or rule out high-risk features, especially looking specifically for, for example, PR interval. Sometimes you quickly look at the ECG, but PR interval, short PR, uh, long PR, long look for QT interval, short or long QT, it's important. And uh, physical examination, obviously vitals, but palpitations, try to feel the pulse. Sometimes you miss, have diagnosed many, many patients with just by palpating their pulses uh, with active fibrillation, PVCs, et cetera, just by palpating their, their pulses. And uh, listen for murmurs. If you suspect, for example, Hocum, listen for murmur, for murmur of Hocum or any valvular disease that might be causing that. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to speak too much about the other investigations because they, they are uh, based on the necessity of the case. And if the patient is requiring further investigations like halters, I prefer to do basic investigations first. I do echo for if there's clear indication. Most of my patients, uh, I do echoes, uh, but some of them are not. Try not to spend too much pay, uh, time with the psych, psych patients, but try to rule out the high-risk features for those patients. And uh, uh, caffeine, excellent, uh, Osama, about the caffeine. It's an excellent uh, uh, presentation for the, uh, especially that caffeine is, is really good for our health. And you should enjoy your morning coffee, but don't overdo it. Don't use it wisely. It's very good. It's healthy. That doesn't cause malignant rhythm problems, but don't overdo it. Uh, unless there is a patient who is sensitive, as Osama mentioned, then you may tell them to uh, reduce the caffeine. I don't tell them to stop it. I tell them always avoid any cardio stimulant triggers, especially alcohol or other drugs, but caffeine just to reduce it. So I'm going to open now to uh, Dr. Khaled Al Wuleid, Dr. Uh, Fatih Idris, and Dr. Sa uh, Isam Paryun. Uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Khaled Al if you can unmute yourself and you can uh, say a couple of words about the presentation. Dr. Khalid Al Walid, if you hear Yes, That's perfect. Yes. With you, Dr. Amrani. Okay. Salam alaikum. Salam. Thanks, Dr. Osama. You hear me well? Yes. Um, very good and very informative uh, lecture. Thank you very much for your effort. You summarized uh, most of our uh, points in our mind, and you, uh, you give us a, a good summary for this. Um, uh, just I want to talk. Uh, um, about some practic uh, practice point in, in our practice uh, here in Libya. I don't know if this uh, points are present there or not. Um, for example, uh, the, uh, the initiation of, of antiarrhythmic treatment early before reach the diagnosis. 
Yeah, just patient one phys uh, in first phys uh, visit come with palpitation, they give him a beta blocker. This can mask the, the story and we don't know. Uh, we have we faced the, some people who's taking, for example, Concord for 10 uh, years. And he even the patient he doesn't know why he take this medication. And we don't uh, have a real diagnosis. Uh, this is a common practice in Libya, uh, really. We face this point. Um, uh, we can say that it, it is a premature initiation of antiarrhythmic treatment before. I think it, we should always uh, catch the arrhythmia. We should have a, a record for every patient uh, before we start the antiarrhythmic treatment. The other point, uh, and if uh, so, some, some patient present with the arrhythmia to the, to the ER, and they diagnosed correctly with this SVT, for example, and they give a, a good management, they, but they don't record this arrhythmia. Just they give them um, uh, the treatment and finish the attack and go home. When this patient come for a uh, follow-up, he, he can um, give you the story. He can, uh, he, he can say for you, I come with palpitation to the ER and my heart rate was 200 or 220 in the monitor, I see it. And they give me some IV medication and it is finished from that time. But what this arrhythmia was, we don't have a recording. Uh, it's a very important to record if there's not emergency, we should record this uh, arrhythmia because we should have a plan for the next step if this uh, medication uh, or this uh, arrhythmia recur or if we give him a medication and not working. We have uh, we should have a plan. We had we should have um, strategy for the treatment. Uh, I done a couple of words about the halter here in Libya. I don't know if there's same same problem up, outside. There are some halters who have a, 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 don't have a, a name for the patient or don't have a good time, a real time for the uh, not rec uh, not correct time in the halter. So this might uh, uh, mask uh, 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 important uh, 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 attack. Uh, for example, there is uh, some um, halter who has um, artifact, a lot of artifact, and some physicians uh, they send you, uh, or give you the record of the uh, self uh, by the computer or not 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 uh, by the user uh, user uh, user uh, um, uh, not manually, not done manually, done uh, computerized. And they give you, for example, the minimum heart rate is 15, uh, 15 beat per minute, and they send patient for the base maker. When you look inside the, uh, the, the halter record, you don't find any, uh, any bradycardia. It's just in the first paper, which is, uh, which is uh, done by computerized, not, not manual. Uh, I, uh, another, another issue in Libya, there's uh, some physicians, Samahamullah, they don't give the medical record to the patient. He came to him in private. He said, you are um, in indicated for the base maker and you have to, 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 to do it. And the patient has come to the public uh, hospital without record. So we face this problem many times. We don't have a record. So how, how we will implant the base maker without, uh, uh, without seeing the ECGs? So some people does not give this record to the patient, which is a big problem. I think. Uh, thank you, Osama, again. So, uh, and thank Dr. Uh, Abdelghani. I don't want to take a lot of time. I want uh, to give a time to my colleagues, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent points. And I hope that uh, the uh, system will allow to uh, those situations to be improved and help our colleagues in Libya to give the best care to our patients, inshallah. I'm uh, sure if you see Dr. Isam Baryoun, Dr. Isam, do you hear me, Isam Baryoun? Can you unmute yourself? Hello. Hi, Dr. Baryoun. You have the floor, yeah? Yeah, Barakallah. Okay, shukran, Dr. Toro Gusbi. Excellent talk. Taban palpitation as a talk is not an easy one to prepare, like, mashallah. You did it very well. A few points, maybe not alaikum. Um, uh, you mentioned the reassurance. That's really probably one of the most important for most patients. And uh, 
especially pots, they can't thinking they have a heart problem because they feel their heart is racing. But once you say no, this is just a vascular maladaptation or mild dysautonomia, it kind of makes them feel a lot better. Um, the other point I want to touch on is the what's known as bradysphygmia, because you mentioned people using pulse locks at home and other type of monitors. You know, the monitor will tell them your heart rate's 40, but really they're having PVCs and the PVCs are not counted by the pulse ox. So they end up having what looks like bradycardia and we call that bradysphygmia. Um, a third point I see in some um, in pa patients who have devices like pacemakers, they have an atrial lead. So the atrial lead is monitoring the atrium 24 seven. So and the ventricular lead is monitoring the ventricle. So a lot of people will think that patients with pacemakers do not need monitors. And I just want to touch on points where they do, especially the pacer-dependent patients. There's really possibility that there's no capture because of high threshold intermittently or over-sensing, and it gets missed. Patient will say, you know, I feel a dizzy spell and then a heartbeat after that. And doing a halter on pacer dependent patients is extremely important when they have those type of symptoms. Um, the fourth point is anticoagulation with all these fancy devices. You know, there are studies and in the future we may start doing anticoagulation as an PRN basis for AFib patients when, if we can prove that those home devices are very accurate in detecting atrial fibrillation, especially in the patients who are not very high risk for stroke uh, and they are high risk for bleed, you can take them off blood thinners and monitor with cardia, for example. That will be something we'll see in the near future. Last point is the coffee. Uh, I agree. Um, the thing I want to also remember is that you see four cups, but how big is the cup. I mean, I see people use mugs that are bigger than my head, and some people, for a cup for them is a small cup. So uh, and that's why I liked in your presentation, you put 400 milligrams of caffeine for two reasons. Number one, the size of the cup. Number two, some people drink a lot of energy drinks, a lot of sodas. So the question is going to be how much coffee, if the patient wants to, to take permission to drink four cups of coffee, immediately I'll say, how many energy drinks do you have? How many sodas? How many tea? cups, you know, and then because we've seen young people die from drinking too many energy drinks with high caffeine beverages on the same day. And um, that's all the points I have. And again, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent points. I totally agree with that. Um, I see Dr. Yusuf Darat has his hand up. Please raise your hands if you have any questions. And if you are see really good uh, speakers here with us and they can also help us with the questions and with the discussion. So please, if you have questions, write them. If you have any uh, comment, please, or question, raise your hand. I'll be happy to help you and allow you to speak. Uh, Dr. Yusuf Darat, uh, you have the floor. You can un unmute yourself. I can't hear you, Dr. Yusuf. You can unmute yourself. Still muted. While waiting for Dr. Yusuf, there is a question. Uh, Dr. Fathadris, we can comment. So no, Dr. Fathadris is on call. He's with the oh, patient, okay. so he'll be with us shortly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Dr. Osama, uh, what's the indication for admission for patients with palpitations? That's a question there. Admission uh, indications. Indication is high risk. Uh, features. So if you suspect that the patient has um, an arrhythmia that is going to be uh, causing symptoms, like dangerous symptoms, for example, syncope, uh, then you need to uh, admit them, especially if it's frequent, so that you know, you're not in the hospital for months just to try to uh, figure out what their uh, arrhythmia is that made them uh, pass out. So high-risk features, the ones that I mentioned in that red box, with symptoms of possible syncope, and you don't know the diagnosis yet, so you're still working on the diagnosis, then you may admit them for monitoring for their safety so that they don't have this arrhythmia um, outside and uh, you know, have sudden cardiac death or something else or get into a car accident. 
but for just the regular run of the mill palpitations with no high risk features, you know, we said the low risk ones don't even need any uh, investigations, um, but, and, but the uh, high risk features are the ones that do warrant investigation. And if, if you're afraid of the patient might uh, harm themselves, then you can admit them, yes. Okay, yeah, excellent. Uh, it's definitely depends on the high risk features or not, or if, as you said, if there's possibility of underlying malignant arrhythmia that might be causing the palpitations, and you're not sure, and you think that safety of patient might require admission, and especially that patient is very symptomatic, even if you can't detect it, and the patient is very symptomatic, then you need to admit, or if you see any other high-risk features on physical exam or ECG or things like that. I agree with you, Dr. Gospi. Uh, Dr. Yusuf Darat, you can unmute yourself uh, if you want. I, I think you'll be able to. Yusuf. Uh, Dr. Yusuf. Hello. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, hello. Salam Allah. Salam alaikum, Abdul Ghani, Usama, and Jamil al Fadur, Barakallah, Fikum. محاضرة ممتازة وسام بارك الله فيك إذا قلت كيكة لكن ما شاء الله أنت خليتها ممتعة جدا وغطيت يعني طبق بجدارة يعني بارك الله فيك حتى دكتور خالد وليد على الإنبوت متاعك بخصوص لي بنقاط مهمة جدا وعصام بارك الله فيك وإن شاء الله أن الدكتور فتحي لحق يعني أنا بس عندي نقطة على الكافين الكافين أنا دراسة observation study وأنا عندي تحفظات عليها لأن أنا في اعتقادي يعني اعتقد حتى ناس هلبة قريت لهم إن دي يعني عندهم خلفية statistical analysis والدراسات إن ال patients who have competition will avoid coffee يعني في دير باي في السيرفي هذا أو في ال data يعني اللي عنده competition و SVT is already they will avoid coffee they would it will appear that they that coffee has reduced arrhythmias لكن in fact it's uh, not not the case لأن they avoid it يعني أي أحسن study تندار هي intervention يعني مثلاً study زي هذه uh, do randomization, hot patients, you, you should book coffee, patients should wash coffee, you should the difference, yani. Like, I think that this is a very good study, and Dr. Isam, and Abdul Ghani, that patients uh, should um, be cautious about coffee. Yani. Too much coffee may cause arrhythmia still, in, in my opinion. We uh, even used it in the EP lab before, when Isam used it, I don't know if we used it, Isam or not, Isam Baryun. Caffeine can uh, induce arrhythmias for the EP lab for induction. فهذه كانت النقطة اللي كان حبيت بس إن نتكلم عليها و... وحتى نفتحوا النقاش لو في أسئلة عليه بارك الله فيك شكرا شكرا جزا شكرا شكرا ما شاء الله excellent uh, points I agree with you yeah definitely that's one of the reasons I always tell my patients is I ask them about the amount of caffeine and relation between palpitations and caffeine and I find that actually there's relation not all patients but there is clear relation between high dose of caffeine high amount like people drink here we have large cups they say, like, I take six, when you say five cups, it's not like our cups in Libya, which is small. We have, we're speaking about, like, sometimes even half a liter. <laughs> so if you say half, if five cups, it can be a really large amount. So it depends on the, I tell them to take small, uh, reduce the caffeine, definitely don't stop it completely, uh, reduce it significantly if you're symptomatic from it. Um, I'll so, yeah, yeah, tell you uh, my approach with caffeine, and mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to change for a while now. But each patient I, is individual. And so if the patient tells me that I have palpitations and I ask them and they say I drink three or four cups of coffee a day and I can't find anything else that might be causing it, I say, okay, let's do an experiment. Stop the coffee for a month and then uh, see how you feel within that month and then restart drinking the same amount of coffee that you drank before and see what happens. If your palpitations come back, then I think you might be sensitive to coffee. If not, go and conquer the world or drink as much coffee as you want. We'll have to look for something else. So um, that's how I approach it until there is some very good data to tell me, you know, yes, uh, caffeine is safe or no, caffeine is not safe. Because we do know that people who drink these energy drinks, which contain a lot of caffeine, uh, like Hassan said, you know, especially truck drivers, you know, they drink a lot of energy drinks and they drink a lot of coffee and they do have, they stay awake, they stay alert, they stay sharp, their heart is racing and they might feel palpitations or sometimes because they've been doing this for so many years, they might not be feeling it, but in fact, you know, their heart is uh, racing and if it was in somebody else, they would have felt the palpitations. So to me, caffeine is an individual uh, issue with each patient. Um, I discuss it with the patient and this, we come up with a plan together 
and see whether it's uh, giving them the symptoms or not. Perfect. I agree with you. Khairul yeah. Murlwasat. Moderation is always the best if you can. Uh, uh, again, patient by patient. Every every time we say always, it's uh, patient's presentation that dictates what we need to do for the patient and what recommendation we need to give. They are not all the same. Depends on the age of the patient, comorbidities, etc. Um, there is another comment here uh, about the uh, UK study, uh, Dr. Gosby. Yeah, this is again about caffeine. I think we spoke about caffeine. Uh, Dr. Adel Dayoub, I think you have your hand on. You have the floor if you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, you say your words. Assalamu alaikum, Jamian. أعطيكم جميعا دسكشن جميل جدا طبعا زي ما قلت موضوع معقد جدا مش قادر حتى نعرف شو نسأل أصلا لكن ال ال what's interesting I echo Yusuf Zarat's concerns I think I'm surprised given the how big this issue is in the cardiology world and nobody wants to do randomized control trials where most of your practice is derived from this so caffeine no caffeine and people with the palpitation would be the ideal study to, to, to come to the conclusion. Uh, to me is like, I, I don't know if you, how comfortable you feel to continue asking people to continue drinking coffee if they're being bothered by, by palpitation all the time. I think it makes no, no, no sense to, to uh, in, in something that has been known. And the evidence is very weak. I think, I, I know it's an observation studies with hundreds and thousands of people, but I don't think it is a, a firm conclusion. And um, most people tend to focus on drinks, energy drinks. I think the stuff that has caffeine, uh, I'll tell you this morning, I got a piece of cake and that ca cake is a red velvet cake. I thought it's not a chocolate, but my son told me this, that this is just a colored chocolate. This has a lot of caffeine because I have a problem with sleeping. So every time I have something that has chocolate or anything, I, I stay awake for three days. So I think to, to calculate the caffeine is not only just from drinks and the stuff we get from chocolates, from foods, and you'd be surprised the food that has a lot of caffeine. Um, Adil, uh, one of the studies that I presented actually also looked at chocolate and there was no increased risk of arrhythmias or palpitations. Dark I, chocolate or brown chocolate, the white chocolate? Um, I'm not sure whether it was, not white, you mean what? milk chocolate. Okay. Right. Uh, but so, I think الكاكاو عادي يعني الكاكاو نمشوا نمشوا عندي فوتو يعني البرامج بتاعنا شوكولاته لكن again again these are not uh, randomized controlled trials yeah, these are you know take it or leave it uh, you can do whatever you want with the information um, again it's just individual individual if you feel like chocolate makes you awake don't eat it how about yeah, decaf? definitely how about it's the uh, Adel it's the decaf. it's in the uh, it's a case by case basis that's what we I think we recommend here to everybody here in Gus is Drink your coffee, enjoy your coffee, don't overdo it, it's case by case. If patients are symptomatic from caffeine, tell them to have a caffeine holiday yeah. until you figure out what's going on, as Dr. Osama mentioned. I'm not sure it would be the same science applicable to Libya. Okay, that's Barakallah Fiyik, Dr. Adil. Uh, I think Dr. Fatih Idris is back now. Dr. Fatih Idris, you can, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself and you say your uh, wisdom words about this presentation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Shukran, Barakallah. Sorry, I stepped out. Uh, no, and I told them no problems. Uh, I understand. I can, uh, uh, very informative, very nice. Shukran, Dr. Usama. Uh, a couple of things. I'm sure I'm not sure if 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 i am indicate that you should have you do you do your best to document the rhythm of the patient when the patient had the symptoms on a piece of paper so monitoring is so crucial and uh, and it's very important not to start medication start any treatment start any diagnosis without having a clear diagnosis uh, unfortunately that's easy said that done and the, the, the best term to use to describe this, what I'm trying to say is symptom rhythm correlation. 
is always try to have symptom rhythm correlation, meaning when the patient have that very symptom, that very palpitations, either fluttering, skip beats, racing heart, whatever they call them, whatever they describe it, they what is their uh, EKG doing at that time? And as you can see, Dr. Usama, if you can pull the slide when you show lots of halters there, uh, there's lots of monitoring uh, tools and they're getting more, getting to the degree you get confused. And he, Dr. Zaman, after I finished my training, there were about halter and two others, King of Heart or whatever. Now we have multiple companies that have several ways. And I don't know if that's the uh, Dr. Khaled earlier, he said not of all, all of those available for Libya. But it's, you understand the concept, it doesn't matter which company does it. So the concept is which monitor to choose to which patient. And is, is that to improve your ability to capture the rhythm? Uh, yes, this slide here. So, so uh, to capture the, the rhythm when the patient has the symptoms. So uh, it all depends on the history. If the patient has symptoms ha happening every day, the patient said every day, uh, I have this palpitation or skip beat, et cetera. And then a halter for 24 hour or 48 hours may be sufficient, like the one in your top right hand of the, of the slide. You see that? Yes, exactly. That's a classical halter. And, and the others, they are actually not called halters. Halter is just a, it's a trade name stuck with this, but they are event monitor loops, external loop, internal loop, implantable loops, and the loops itself goes to links, reveals, all, and et cetera. So, but the, so the term halter just, it records every single heartbeat for the next 24, 48 hours, whatever. The patient has the ability to trigger, have the ability, but cannot to communicate with the device directly. The patient has to have a piece of paper and write the time, and then when they go to do the analysis, they, then they correlate to try to see, okay, this is a time when the patient triggered the device or not. It's a little bit hectic. So that's for the halters. If the patient's symptoms happen not daily, if, if the patient's symptoms happen twice a month, maybe three times a month, giving a halter is completely useless, unfortunately. Because you need a big chance that you, in the days the patient wore the monitor, he would have the symptoms. And that's a matter of complete luck. It's a matter of lottery. So it's very hard. So the yield of giving a halter monitor to somebody who has rare symptoms happens every two to three, once a month or once every two months is rather rare. And then you give, need to give the patient a monitor that can wear for about four weeks, six weeks, like the one on the middle or the one on the left here on the screen. So one of these called Ziobat patch here we have in the US, some of them and the multiple come, exactly. And these are actually, these are monitors where the patient can, uh, they will give him uh, a cell phone like device and the patient can touch the, the, the monitor and activate every time feel the symptoms can touch this patch you see it on his chest and and this can trigger the device and mark it for you so when you go and look at the tracings you see mark okay here's the patient felt the symptoms maybe like you said earlier or seven maybe completely normal sinus rhythm and you tell the patient this is a negative study and, and, and you tell him the symptoms you have are not related to arrhythmia. Whatever you feel, we have that. Because this is when you press your button and the EKG was completely normal. So, but if you give a monitor for 24 hours, not gonna capture this because you, this is, you need weeks or so. Now, if the patient's symptoms happens once every uh, three months or twice a year or once, and then even giving that thing with the patch is gonna be the same thing. Likely in these three, four weeks, you give him the monitor, the patch, he may has no symptoms. And then, and these are the ones you go to the top right, top left part of your slides to the implantable stuff. And the implantable, so simple. Now, many places they can do them in the office. Uh, it's simple incision. It takes you about eight minutes to do the whole procedure and put a stitch or sometimes not even a stitch and done. And that, and that implantable loop will stay in the body uh, usually it has a, bat a battery that lasts for three years, sometimes three and a half years. And not only that, and also the patient will be given some tool so it can mark the times when they feel the symptoms. Typically syncope, but other symptoms can be to assess AF burden and stuff. So what I'm trying to, to say here is it's very important to know which tool to choose for which symptom so you can have the, the golden standard, which is symptom rhythm correlation. Now, I see a lot of halter monitors 
either uh, here where I practice in the United States or sometimes from Tunis, from Libya, from other. Unfortunately, many of those reports are, unfortunately are completely useless because the report you find a big chunk of saying the patient has 6,400 beats, patient have whatever number of PAC, whatever number of PVCs, whatever number of those and all of this, which has sometimes practically no meaning. Unless there is a, a line indicates how many times the patient has symptoms when the monitor was worn and where were we these correlated to any particular arrhythmias or not. And this will bring up to the interpretation of monitor. As, as there is a big difference between a negative Holter monitor or a non-diagnostic Holter monitor. If the, if the patient wore the monitor for two days and then has no symptoms and brought it back to you and you read it and it's completely normal sinus rhythm with a few PVCs, PACs, you cannot say this is a negative Holter monitor. This is non-diagnostic because the patient did not have the symptoms. The diagnostic Holter monitors only if the patient has the symptoms and there is no arrhythmia associated with it. And that's, that's you can write the monitor is neg negative. The positive monitor, of course, if the patient has arrhythmia and you capture it and correlate to the rhythm. That's not common, that's rare, but that's what you call it monitor. So it's very important when you use terminology negative versus non-diagnostic Holter monitor. Last thing I wanna mention, because I think somebody mentioned this before, I wanna just put emphasis on that, use of medication, especially for POTS. I see that you spoke about POTS and stuff. It, it try, to, try to resist the temptation of starting everybody on a beta blocker without diagnosis, without, especially on POTS and this kind of things. A funny channel blocker like Avebradine may work. I have good experience with it. Like you said, uh, Sam, I like that in certain category. But if you try to use beta blockers, especially for undiagnosed palpitation, et cetera, the patient may feel great for three weeks, a month or so. But after that, what happened, the escalation starts. So the, the body will build more receptors for the specific fixed amount of adrenal in the system and this, they, it becomes more sensitive. And then the patient comes with a worsening palpitation. You increase the dose, it takes them three, four months. And at the end, you find yourself chasing your tail. You're giving the patient a large amount of beta blockers and the symptoms recur after every. So try to resist giving the beta blockers unless there is another indication, for example, hypertensive or coronary artery disease or other reasons to give the beta blockers. Uh, I think these are the comments I have. I'm sorry about the lengthy uh, discussion, but these are things that are, I think are very practical, at least from what I learned over, over the, the last few years. Fantastic. Uh, very, very good points. I totally agree with you, Fatfi, and these are very helpful. I might add also for the diagnosis, I sometimes mention to my patients, if they have close by walk-in clinic or anywhere they can get an ECG, if they have prolonged palpitation that lasts for say several minutes, just go do an ECG, please, because that's a good correlation, symptom correlation approach, which uh, I have actually found it uh, useful for a few patients. So try that option also, if patient has symptoms, just go somewhere, do an ECG if possible, uh, that way you have, and always keep the ECG. I, uh, I highly recommend that everybody who does an ECG to send the ECG with the referral to the cardiologist. So that way you know what you are dealing with if there's arrhythmia, especially if that happens in the emergency de department, especially after cardioversion, for example. Uh, there's- uh, Abdelhani, just to add- Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, the documentation ECGs. What I do is actually give my patients a copy of the ECG to put in their wallet and take a picture of it on their phone. So that when they go to wherever they go, if they have like, they, this is what I had, this is the documentation. You don't have to kind of question my uh, words and say whether I do have that problem or not. Excellent. Yeah, that's that's even good. yeah there are two people uh, uh, actually raising their hands, but I am aware of that. Just Dr. Osama Bhalil asked a question about inappropriate science like her. Dr. Bhalil, do you want to comment on that? Do you want to uh, ask your question? If you unmute yourself, Osama. If you still Shukran Abdul Ghani, uh, Shukran Usama Al Haqiqa, it was very excellent, super uh, lecture. Wallah. Uh, I learned a lot, Barakallah Fiq. It was very nice for the presentation. The Hajj Wahid, the Limunkan Bundifabis, the Zumala, and Nefi Libya, and the whole three CGs, and Magal Dr. Khaled, the Walid, and we don't use it in a proper way. Al Haqiqa. 
اللي يديروا في الانتربريتيشن في العاده النيرسز اللي مقعمزين في الـ في الـ في الواحد في, في اللاب يديروا في البرنت اوت واحنا نشوفه في البرنت اوت بناء على ما هي تراه الممرضه اللي موجوده في في المستشفى او في العياده انا انصح الدكاتره كلهم ان كل واحد بيطلب فولتر اي سي جي الافضل انه هو يشوفه براحه على المونيتور والافضل طبعا وي هاف تو تيتش اور بيشنت انه يدير منشن امتى التايم اللي صارت له السيمتومز وحاول كيف تكون زي ما قال دكتور فتحي بارك الله فيه ان يكون في كورليشن بين السيمتومز والفايندينجز اللي موجوده في الهولتر لان هي هذه الحقيقه هذه بوينتس ميسنج الوت يعني وي دونت تيتش اور بيشنت انه هو يسجل التايم اللي صارت له الايفنت وفي نفس الوقت نعتمدوا على البرنت اوت اللي يدروا لنا فيه النيرسز ولا التكنيشن اللي يشتغلوا في الـ في الـ في الـ في, في الهولتر لابس والحقيقه هذه طبعا لوت اوف داتا ميسنج فهي هذه الكومنت الوحيده اللي ممكن بنضيفها تاكيد على الكومنت اللي قالها دكتور خالد واللي زاد اكد عليها دكتور فتحي بارك الله فيك اسامه مره ثانيه ات واز فيري اكسلنت والله بارك الله فيك الله يبارك فيك اسامه ما شاء الله بالنسبه للانبروبريت ساينس تاكارديا اسامه اتس نوت ان كومن لكن نعطي الدكتور خالد الوليد سيل وذاس دكتور خالد دو يو سي ان ابروبريت ساينس تاكيكارديا اند هاو دو يو مانج ذوس بيشنتس There's a question about inappropriate signs like cardia. Show the slide, yeah, Bhani, or not? Hey, what? Hey, thank you, Osama. Unmute yourself, Doctor Khaled. Mas mash fiq. Aye, wa. You hear me now? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. It is. Hello. Uh, yeah, we hear you now. It's uh, yeah, about okay. inappropriate signs like cardia. If you can give us your approach about the uh, just quick approach about the management and. frequency how how you deal with those patients it is not uncommon here and we have a difficult to for diagnose for this, uh, this patient uh, really yeah. most of them uh, diagnose as sinus tachycardia sure. you no know, um yeah patient today um who i'm having trouble and struggling with yes. controlling his inappropriate sinus sinus tachycardia unfortunately it's not an easy easy uh, condition diagnosis to, to to treat and diagnose and treat now there are the diagnostic criteria so for us here it might be a little bit easier but they do have to have a heart rate of greater than 100 beats a minute and an average heart rate of 90 beats per minute um, over a 24 hour period but the interesting thing about uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia is that they their heart rate drops at night which is a protective uh thing so that they don't develop uh tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy so they're not at increased risk of that but obviously it's a diagnosis of exclusion you have to make sure that you've excluded everything that causes tachycardia and you have these um uh, criteria and then that will be your diagnosis unfortunately the treatment is very difficult medication doesn't always work you know lifestyle changes may help uh, psych psychological assessment and assistance may help but um, nobody really knows the mechanism uh, sinus node hypersensitivity do you send them for ablation or modification of the sa node maybe one of the our ep colleagues can uh, talk about that but it's people are very reluctant to do that they might end up having a pacemaker you can make things worse um, but yeah it's not a fun condition to uh, be following that's for sure yeah i agree with you it's not uncommon uh, we see it but it's again most, most important point as Osama mentioned diagnosis of exclusion so you have to exclude as other pathologists I would recommend highly recommend to do a thyroid function test to search I have diagnosed hyperthyroidism for several patients like this missed um, do the usual stuff to make sure there is no underlying pathology I use beta blockers but now actually I use a vabradine I like vabradine I have several patients being treated with a vabradine it's very effective if you have vabradine available and you're sure it's inappropriate sinus tachycardia, I would strongly recommend. It doesn't affect the blood pressure, mainly affects the heart rate. People feel very well. I have actually just two days ago, a pharmacist who was suffering from this condition for a long time. We excluded everything, started him a few months ago on vabradine. Yesterday, he was very happy. He said, I've never felt better than like this. So again, di correct diagnosis and correct management. Management is is uh, the approach, the whole approach, like to prevent this tachycardia from happening, and medications at the end 
And generally speaking, for palpitation, I'd like to emphasize the importance of investigating first before initiation of therapy. But after you initiate therapy, I would encourage people to use treatment if the patient is still symptomatic, even beta blockers. I won't say to people here, go back, don't give beta blockers to anybody, but I, the, the, the um, point from my colleagues here to say, don't use beta blockers early on before confirming the diagnosis or, or ruling out other problems. But after that, you can try, try treatment if the patient is still symptomatic, if you can't find any other underlying cause. Uh, Dr. Jalor, sorry, I kept you waiting. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself and you can, uh, you can uh, say your comments. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum سؤالي دكتور على الفيتامين د ديفيشنسي هل انتم ملاحظين او لا ما نعرفش ما حضرتش انا بدايه المحاضره ان هل ليه رول في الساينس تاكيكارديا والاريثميا او لا لانني يعني لاحظت قداش مره في الاو بي دي يجيني كي يانغ فيميل ولا يانغ مال يجي ببالبيتيشن نلقوا مرات ساينس تاكيكارديا وبمجرد ما يرتاح شويه ينقص لكن لما ندروا له كومبليتيك انفستيجيشن نلقوا ديما فيتامين د ديفيشنسي وبعد ما نبدو لك يعني التريتمنت نعطوا لك يعني جست انرجيزيا وفيتامين د انجكشن 200000 ونقولوا له فولو اب لما يتابع ان الاعراض يعني تختفي ما نعرفش هل انت فيه رول او لا. A very good point yeah vitamin D is very common but I'll give that to Dr. Fatih Idris. Dr. Idris if you can hear me are you able to answer that question about correlation between vitamin D deficiency and palpitations? Um, I don't know if there is any good uh, studies correlating you know, the, the two conditions together. Vitamin D probably is not uncommon in general. It's a common problem. Lots of people have it. You know. uh, myself had vitamin D deficiency when I had my blood work last year. So I ended up taking some blood uh, vitamin D. So it's not an uncommon problem. And of course, the degree of symptoms can be variable. So is this an incidental or if there's good correlation? I, I, I don't know if there is data out there to to, to uh, specifically have looked at this. I'm curious now after this presentation, I'm going to go look it up. But uh, يعني it happens in vitamin D. But is this, is, is, if there is, is this is so Arad's subjective, but is there any objective documentation that the heart rate? Uh, goes from like 115 beats per minute. Yeah, no, palpitation is fine. Sim it's, it's subjective symptoms. Could the patient yeah. tired fatigue? But is there any objective evidence? Yeah, so it's, yeah, the feeling overall. Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to see if there is if this subjective. I felt it this time, not in bottom line, there is no evidence, as Dr. Fatih just mentioned, there is no evidence to support that. But definitely, uh, patients with uh, uh, vitamin D deficiency, they have general symptoms. One of them is palpitations. Uh, and they will, have, uh, they will have improvement in their symptoms, most likely uh, including palpitations. بهم السؤال الثاني هل هو احتمال لما الواحد يقعد يستمر في فيتامين د يعني ديفيشنسي او فيتامين فيتامين د يخش في اريثميا ويخش في اس بي تي وهيك لان في قصه تو انا لاحظت مثلا زي تو احنا الدكاتره وخاصه هما اللي ان بيشنت زي جماعه الانستيزيا كذا شخص هيك يجي حتى هما في في الميديسين احنا يقولون يحكي لنا عنه بالبيتيشن وهيدك وكذا فهمت مرات في وحدين نلقوا فيهم حتى اس بي تي ونعطوا لهم منجمت وكذا ولما نجوا في الانفستيجيشن بتاعتهم نلقوا بيه عندهم فيتامين د هو الحاجه الوحيده اللي ديفيشنسي بمجرد ما انهم ياخذوا الفيتامين د تتعد الامور يعني حتى الاعراض تختفي فهمت قصدي انا حسيت كان في رول هو يعني ما نعرفش هل في قص الادرينالين لما ترتفع تقعد هل هو ارثموجينيك قصدي هذا سؤال دكتور اعطي دكتور اسامه القص يتفضل There is no evidence that I found about um, vitamin D and arrhythmias or palpitations. Lacking the question is, why did you order vitamin D to begin with? Then this is not a routine lab. No, I didn't say it was not routine. I'm going to tell you. Because I'm going to do a whole thing. This is your observation. Just an observation, yeah. So I noticed that this is how. I think it's more than a person who is good. I'm going to say that he's going to do a whole thing. 
لما يدونا نقولوا انقص فهمت ما بدات انا يعني اي شخص يجيني بالكومبلين هذا مع الانفستيجيشن نكتب فيه فيتامين د نلقى فيه الانفستيجيشن كلها كويسه وفيتامين د نلقاه ناقص هذا الحق بدات ندير فيه يعني مع كل حاله تجي كومبلينين هيك يا دكتوره ما دام انت يعني في مكان عندك الكم من المرضى هذو اللي هم عندهم سيمتومز فيتامين دي علاش ما تبديش في اوبزرفيشنال ستدي تلمي داتا انت And this is probably a publishable, uh, publishable study. يعني إذا كان this is a novel thing to think of. And we don't even check it for anybody <laughs> who has palpitations or any arrhythmias. It's not even <laughs> on our radar. يعني هناك ما فيش. عادي الحق ما دبيل يعني أنا قصدي كذا شخص مش حاجة واثنين يعني وخلال سنتين تو هم اللي الأخيرات لاحظت هم بخاصة خلال سنتين لو مثلاً عشرين شخص that's not a big number. لكن <laughs> <تصفيق> إيه لا فيتامين دي او بس بنزيد ناكد عليها دكتوره سمر هو فيتامين دي از فيري ديفيشنسي از فيري كومن فيري فيري كومن اند اتس كان بي فيري ديترمينتال كان بي فيري سيمبتوماتيك بيشنتس كان بي فيري تايرد دي دونت نو واي ذي ار نوت فيلينج ويل انتل ذي جيت ذا فيتامين دي ريبليسمنت وبالبيتيشنز اولسو فيري كومن ون اوف ذا موست كومن ون اوف ذا موست كومن فيزيتس تو ايمرجنسي از بالبيتيشنز لايك 16% ان ون اوف ذا ستاديز 16% اوف كارديك بيشنتس كم تو ايمرج از بيكوز اوف بالبيتيشنز سو اي ام نوت سربرايز تو هير ذات ذوز بيشنتس سم اوف ذيم اور لوتس اوف ذيم هاف فيتامين دي نوت نيسيسيرلي تو بي ذا كوز اوف ذا بالبيتيشنز بات ميبي اد اد اب اي ديفينيتلي وود ريكومند اولز تو كونتينيو ذا سيم بلان از دكتور جوسبي منشن تو رول اوت اذر هاي ريسك فيتشرز Then you treat, as, as you mentioned, you treat, you treat the condition and uh, vitamin D replacement is, is mandatory, as you know. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, now, uh, Ayman had in the chat said that there is a report correlating vitamin D deficiency with heart rate variability and sinus tachycardia. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, definitely. There will be something like that, but not pathological. Like, uh, oh, I mean, I told you, this question is that I mean, I see it that I'm in the middle of a not one, but two. No, 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 تختفي في الاعراض كومبليتلي وفي وحدين ترجع لهم وترجع لهم حتى الارثميه في وحده مثلا عندهم اس في تي بمجرد ما انه هم نلقوا نلقوا التحليل فيتامين د ديفيشنس فحسيت كان في قصدي رابط فهمتني بين ال يو نيفر نو يو نيفر نو دكتور فتحي تفضل يا سو سو اتس ان انتريستنج ديسكشن سو دكتوره جلول اتس بروبلي يعني لايك دكتور اسامه سيد اف يو هاف ذس لارج نمبر اوف بيشنتس They have symptoms so uh, of palpitation, and and you do vitamin D, you find it deficient. It's and and you give them the treatment, and they get better. So this is a subjective improvement, Yani. So it could be related, could be. I'm not aware, Yani. There may be data mm-hmm. out there, but I'm not aware of this uh, tight relationship. There may be uh, uh, the fact that I don't know it. It doesn't mean it's not existing. But what I'm saying is that be careful because. Subjective evidence of link between uh, these two conditions, palpitation is like uh, Abdulani said, palpitation is quite common. Vitamin D deficiency is quite common. Lots of people have it and they don't know even they have it. I told you I had myself and I was completely asymptomatic. So, but the fact that you replace vitamin D doesn't necessarily mean that this patient's arrhythmia is all. They still can have atrial fibrillation. They can have SVT, something else. So even if they subjectively felt better, With the with the vitamin D improvement, because vitamin D severe deficiency can cause people tired and fatigue, it doesn't mean that the palpitation is fixed. You always keep in mind that if they come with palpitation again, just don't crank up vitamin D to the roof. Just just kept okay. This is vitamin D. So so you object. You need to get an objective correlation. So you give. It's still worth giving them the monitor and see what's the symptoms they have. Where were their report palpitations? You see what I'm saying? So two common conditions can coexist together, but you need to have an objective evidence. What the patient's heart rate is doing when they have those symptoms? Perfect. Yeah, that's that's a great discussion. I totally agree with all those points. Uh, I think we should wrap up Osama here. Uh, I would like to ask any of the audience if they have any other questions. Please raise your hand. Raise your hand if you have questions. I will be happy to uh, open the floor for you. And 
I then I have to wrap up now. Uh, I will start with you, Dr. Sama al -Gusby. If you have any final comments about the presentation, anything you'd like to add? Barakallahu uh, feek, Dr. Abdelghani. This is a very excellent discussion, um, very useful. Uh, in fact, you always uh, think that you know, but um, you get when you hear your colleague talk, you get to uh, realize how much little you know. Um, but my uh, advice is to uh, listen to your patient, uh, take a good history, do a good physical exam, don't over uh, investigate. Um, and that's pretty much it. Those are the key points. Thank you very much. Dr. Khaled al if you can uh, say your final comments. Thank you, Dr. Osama, for this nice uh, lecture. Thanks, Abdul uh, Ghani, for organization and all the uh, team with you. Uh, my last message is be patient with your patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Rafat Hadris, your final comments, if you have. And now, I think I the same thing. Thank you, everybody. This was a very informative presentation and very common problems, uh, not easy a topic to handle. But uh, again, I think uh, it was interesting discussions and uh, very informative. And I don't have uh, much to, uh, to add other than the few comments I said earlier. Thank you Thank so much, you. everybody. Thank you much. Dr. Isan Baryun are still with us, I think. Uh, I didn't see him. Dr. Isan Baryun. Dr. Isam, yeah, I haven't seen him. Okay, so I think we should wrap up. It's excellent, again, excellent talk, excellent presentation, excellent discussion. I appreciate every time's uh, uh, presence with us today and uh, especially Dr. Sam al for his excellent uh, presentation effort for this presentation, excellent uh, discussion. Thank you to the audience for their excellent uh, questions and comments. And inshallah, we'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.